We don't see iron nickel alloys naturally on Earth. It's extremely unique in nature. These guys are essentially the cores of failed planets. Okay, are planets built on crystals? Oh, ha! So we've got slices of meteorites here, and these are a particular kind of meteorite called an iron meteorite. These are essentially all made of iron nickel metal. These are unique. Currently, we don't have anything that we 100% know of that exists like this on Earth. So you guys know how we have our crust, mantle, and then core. Well, our core is made out of metal. These guys are essentially the cores of failed planets. So as you guys know, we have multiple different asteroid belts out in our solar system. Well, those asteroid belts are representative of heavenly bodies that didn't quite get to be planets. Not all of them, but quite a few of them are. So these guys are what's theorized to be at the center of those planets. There is planetary gaps in our solar system and they're called the Kirkwood gaps. Meteorites, planets, nothing can really exist in these gaps. And that's because of the gravitational pull from the sun and Jupiter. Jupiter and the sun are in a giant tug of war contest with all all of these different meteorites and asteroids. So we really are lying in what is essentially a Goldilocks zone. We get to remain existing because we are in an area that Jupiter can't pull us out of orbit and the sun can't pull us out of orbit. What happens is, is if a meteor or an asteroid enters a Kirkwood gap, they can be pulled out of orbit and possibly flung somewhere. That is how we get a lot of our meteorites here on Earth. It's theorized that the centers of these planetesimals, which we find as iron nickel meteorites, is extremely similar to what we have at our core, which is really cool. You guys may be wondering why this metal has like a crosshatch pattern. What you are in fact seeing is different crystals of metal. And that kind of, what you're seeing here is two different kinds and they're called camasite and taenite. Since they contain different varying amounts of iron to nickel, you get these different banding. These guys are known as fine octahedrite. And basically what that means is fine refers to how thick the lines are. And they're called octahedrites because the iron nickel metals create an octahedral crystal shape. When you first cut an iron nickel meteorite, you don't see this. The way that they're exposed is by using acid to actually etch the two different iron nickel alloys so that you can see the Wiedmann-Staten pattern. So we decided to try to give our best shot at acid etching a meteorite. So through the power of YouTube, let's see how it goes. We're going to etch a meteorite today. And so we're going to get our etching solution. It's 30% solution of phosphoric acid. And obviously we're wearing gloves and safety glasses. This one's pretty mild. It's an acid that's definitely like safe to use in the house. They're using it for hydroponics. That's what it's made for, but you want to be safe. So we're going to pour it into our beaker. Once we put our meteorite slice in the beaker, we're going to let it etch for a while and then we're going to take it, put it in water to rinse off the acid and then we're going to throw it into alcohol. And the alcohol is just going to replace all the water that gets onto and in maybe some of like the cracks and stuff in the meteorite. And then it evaporates off quickly so that we don't get like a whole lot of rust. So we've got our decently sized meteorite slice. And it's been polished, obviously, because we want to be just as surprised as you guys about what the pattern looks like. The reason we're doing this is we are going to reveal the internal crystalline structure of our meteorite. It has camasite and taenite in it, which are both iron nickel metal alloys. And the camasite is five to 10% nickel by weight. And the taenite is 30 to 50% nickel by weight. And what that means is that you get these lines that run through the meteorite that show you the different crystalline patterns that are in there because the camasite and taenite actually like aren't mixed necessarily together. They actually create like a woven structure of metal crystals, which is really cool. So to reveal that pattern, we have to acid etch the meteorite. So we are gonna leave this, I think for a few hours total, but we're gonna be coming back and forth and checking on it. The reason you wanna keep checking on it is that you can actually etch it too much 
and then it just kind of looks like gobbledygook. But if you don't do it enough, you don't get a very strong pattern. So you kind of just have to take it out when you like it. Yes, we're gonna leave this alone for a while and we're gonna come back and check it. Okay, so we're like at five hours and I have to say I'm not really liking the amount of black I'm seeing on this. I have really not etched meteorized before. This is all like theoretical and now we're making it into practical. <laughs> Let's see how we did. Oh, this might have worked. Okay, so we're gonna rinse it and I'm like really gripping this hard with these tweezers because I don't wanna scratch it. Okay, let's give it a good swirl. Gosh, that stinks. You wanna let that alcohol get into all the cracks and stuff because it'll help drive that water out. Wow, I think that really worked. It's actually really cool. I'm really proud of this. It's actually pretty strong up here near the top. Most of the time, most meteorites are actually etched with like nitric acid or nitrol. And you literally drop it in there and take it out within like five seconds. That's how like corrosive that acid is. So I was really kind of worried that like the metal wouldn't be etched by the acid that we were using, but it obviously works. We obviously got definite crystalline pattern on here. It's really pretty neat. It's still really weird that like part of this thing didn't etch. Maybe it's like a taenite spot that's like super nickel-y. I really wanted to, I might've gotten greedy and try to like polish some of the tarnish off and then keep going but I think I'm pretty happy with it. So through the magic of YouTube, I will be right back in a different shirt for more meteorite fun. So I've got another clue. Okay, we know about crystals, but can meteorites also have gems? The answer is yes, and it's palisitic peridot is the gemstone that comes from palisites. What we're looking at is an iron nickel metal with our peridot crystals. You guys can watch our peridot video here if you're curious, but if you've already seen it, you know that peridot usually comes deeply sourced. It's usually pretty much right near our mantle. Palisites are believed to have come from basically the core mantle boundary of failed planetoids that started the process of something called Differentiation. Differentiation is basically where if you have a gobbledygook of rock and you get enough of it together to say, make a planet, the core will actually start to heat because of gravitational pull. When your center starts cooking, you start getting denser material toward the center, medium density, and then you have your lighter elements all on the outside. And that's actually a lot of the way that our planet works too. So we've got two Stony meteorites. Basically, if you were to see this out in like a playground or something, you wouldn't think anything of it. <laughs> it's composed of predominantly stone, but they can have a little bit of metal in them too. But these stony meteorites are called chondrites because they contain little round objects called chondrules. Basically, you see little polka dots in there and each of those little individual polka dots is a chondrule. And chondrules, are basically the dirt and dust of our early solar system before all the planets formed, which is really cool. All right, so our final box and our final clue. But how do they get here? Well, obviously they fall. Okay, I have a stick of metal and I have a meteorite in a box. So you all may be familiar that with most meteorites actually will have like a crust to them or look like basically like they've been cooked. So this one looks really smooth on the outside. They've been ablated, which is basically vaporized away as they enter the atmosphere. So they kind of look all melty or at least smoothed in some way. Well, this guy does not meet that criteria. So you can tell it's pretty sharp. There's no like rounded edges. And what's really interesting is I can actually see some of the splitting between the lamellae or the different iron nickel metal crystals. This is part of what is called an airburst. And airbursts are really cool, but slightly terrifying to think about. So what happens when a large body enters our atmosphere? Cracks can form in it. Those cracks can obviously expand and then the meteor can actually be essentially blown apart. We call that an airburst. It essentially blows up midair and just scatters meteorite material all over the place. So you could just be 
out walking around and have an airburst and all of a sudden it's like a scattering of rocks flying out of everywhere. This is a piece of the very famous meteorite Chelyabinsk. Chelyabinsk itself is an airburst, but this is not a piece of airburst material. This still has the nice melted surface on it. So basically this would have fallen off maybe farther up in the atmosphere and had time to actually get a little cooked. So it was in 2013. I think I was actually in geology class when everybody came in the next day and started talking about it. Everyone was watching the YouTube videos that the Russian citizens had uploaded. This meteorite was videoed so extensively that scientists were able to get on YouTube and because they knew the positions of where the cameras were, on buildings and stuff like that, they were able to figure out the speed, the angle, and they could estimate where some of the larger pieces actually fell. When they break up in the air, it actually kind of helps us out <laughs> because then we don't have all however many tons hitting the ground all at once. Instead, it scatters it out. These little bitty pieces hit terminal velocity pretty quickly and they basically just kind of piff into the ground and then they're fine to go pick up and they don't, you know, make like a crater. Okay, so I have been told we're doing another experiment. So how do we know if we are standing in a meteor crater? So this is not a box. We've got our big bowl of flour and then we have some boxes of cocoa powder. Oh gosh, that went everywhere. Well now I am covered in cocoa powder. So basically these are just different layers of soil. Essentially, I am making a contrast so you guys can see how much soil gets turned up and thrown when a meteorite hits the earth and actually creates what's called an ejecta blanket. Okay, so I have a Canyon Diablo meteorite, which is from Arizona, and uh, it's pretty hefty. We don't get too many tries with this because uh, once it mixes, we're kind of done. So, Let's make our crater. Woohoo! So you guys can see how you get mixing of different soils and different rocks when a meteorite hits. And of course now we have like a big mess. We had cocoa powder go all the way across like the whole table. When you have a meteorite impact, you can actually fling material really far away. So like Moldavite, the meteorite that created Moldavite struck in Germany and the material ended up all the way in the Czech Republic. So there you go. It'll give you guys a really good idea of why if you look at pictures of meteorite craters on the moon, how you see all this light material surrounding the crater and then it's a little bit darker where it wasn't impacted. So I hope you guys learned something really cool about meteorites today. I for one think that we're pretty lucky that we didn't end up like these guys and instead got to, you know, like be here on earth. Before we go, we're gonna take a closer look at this really cool slice of meteorite with its awesome Weedmanstaten pattern. So have you all ever seen a falling star or a meteor shoot across the sky? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to like, subscribe and ring that bell. Thanks for watching.